name is uh, Dr. Calvin Brown, and I'm the uh, clinical director for the SI Institute. And this is uh, my partner right here, Dr. Uh, James Chapman, who's a uh, brother from a different month. I like that. I like that. I like that. <laughs> hey guys, how you doing? Dr. C. Yeah, and uh, you know what? We are going on this webinar because you know we know that there's been some challenging times that kind of us were all going to go go through, but we want to help you move forward, and that's the reason why we're doing this. We're not having challenges. Times. We're gonna kick some butt yeah. by storm. Yes. You know, I mean, I, I was listening to a webinar by Grant Cardone uh, the other day, and it's about how to react. And he had six different ways that people react to something that's going through. And our reaction on this webinar is about moving forward strong, getting ready for things to be lifted, not to go into the uh, details of the COVID 19 and all that other kind of garbage. Mm -hmm. So it's a positive webinar today. Well, yes, and for any of you that know us, we always tend to start off with uh, a song, okay? Yeah, we and got the song. He, 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 I picked this. He picked this today, so let's. You uh, think you didn't think I knew what hip hop? Oh, uh, this is considered hip hop. This is more like rap, right? Would this be considered hip hop or rap? This is my age. Cause I man, that's like arguing the difference between country and western. Well, I don't Come know on, this dude. Stuff, man. Man. I, I like dance music. But, <laughs> all right, cool, all right cool. let's just go with this. Yeah, my man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the dude. The song title is called Business. Yes. <laughs> Let's oh get down to business. Goodness. I thought that was completely appropriate. I think so. You know, I totally it's so. time to uplift people. Let's grab these next couple weeks. Let's move forward strong. And one thing that Greg Cordon recommended on this live webinar when I was on with him was okay. you want to react positively. Stay away from all the press and stuff, focus on your business, and start kicking some butt. Yes, and you know what? And Especially social media, he said. He goes, don't get in your uh, sweat with people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, anybody knows me. I, I have to stay out sometimes of certain arguments because it just gets too intense. We, but you want to focus on the things that are important to you. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to <clears throat> shut down your practice, you want this, and keep up with some of the world or something, that's sure. okay. Sure. It's just, Really want to focus on the positive energy of the things to really know what to do, how to grab and react. And he goes obviously ten times X. Yeah. You know? So and you know, unfortunately these days, uh, there's sort of like maybe a couple of camps here about those who are saying, you know, whether I should be open to work versus those that I should not. And Doc, you want to kind of elaborate yeah. on that just a little bit? Well, yeah. I mean, in the last six weeks, I mean, you guys that are viewing, um, obviously some have shut down the office. No fault there. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, you know, with our practice, our faculty office, we ask all of our uh, our team, are you comfortable? Are you not? That's right. It's not gonna jeopardize your job, take a vacation, hiatus, whatever, not a problem. So I've seen there's a camp that shut down the practice, then I see that there's a camp that said, I will see emergencies, but they never really need to told anybody about it. But actually, the practice is closed. They accept some emergencies of their own patient base by phone, I see. And then I see some other, like us, that um, we were requested by oral surgeons to stay open uh, due to the amount of implants and surgeries and things like that we do. And so we decided, hey, you know, as a huge practice, we don't have the base for urgent care. Well, you know, I mean, we have some of the people, because we're a very large office, that do come in for urgent care once in a while. But, you know, to keep a practice open, you know, unless you're in urgent care, you're really not known for urgent care. So when people think they're shut down, nobody knows we're open. Right. And you know, one of the, uh, the philosophies and sense we have here at the SI Institute is we look in terms of what we do is we are actually physicians of the oral cavity. No, absolutely. Uh, right. We're healthcare workers and we, we, we are just like, you know, my colleagues are ER doctors, you know, and uh, we protect ourselves, protect our, our patients. Uh, we did all the things that are necessary. But uh, important to that comment is we also took the initiative, we were that third camp where we external marketed to grab the patients to let everybody know that we're open. And quite frankly, it's been, uh, we, we've been pretty slammed, actually. You know, and when you talk about that third camp about as far as being opening, um, you know, as a director for the SI Institute, I actually, I don't know if I told you about this, but I actually took the initiative to call one of Arizona's leading attorneys that represents tenants in front of the board. Okay? okay. And I specifically uh, asked him, I said, listen, somebody comes on in I, uh, to anywhere in your mouth or pain, swollen, broken down, the tooth is not restorable. Totally. Okay? And I said to him that if I was to place a uh, bone stabilizer along with uh, bone graft to actually repair the site, 
So an immediate implant? That's right. All right. That's right. And I wanted his opinion on that, and he thought about it for a second. He said, you know what? I will stand by you guys absolutely free to move. So that would be considered a non-elective procedure. Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're pulling my number eight, mm -hmm. and when does shit happen? Shit happens when you're on vacation. That's right. You know, that's when it happens. When's the emergency gonna happen? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm not gonna let you pull number eight unless you're putting an immediate implant on me. That's right. Fact. And I'll actually force you to make me a, a good looking screw retake town so I can keep my merchant's profile. I'm gonna take you up a level, level. And you gotta temporize him? Yeah, this boy is smart. You know? I like that. You, I you, like make, that. you, you make me look beautiful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the point of that story is right there is, is that, yeah, that is acceptable. And so we released all of our students at SI that who are completely proficient and doing immediate placements, that heck, it changes the game where our students are, re are ready for the emergencies. And we want all doctors to be able to know that fact because I think it's important, to, uh, especially who knows how long this will last. But once again, we're preparing per state. We're in Arizona lifting at what, May 1st. That's what, what they're saying is. And we're gonna prepare that we are. Yes, we know what, and think about all of these things. I actually have, um, so like, uh, Take the response. Take all pass. That makes me sound old, but I do actually have a response to this right <laughs> <You> now. <did not. laughs> oh yeah. Okay. When when things went south, we both did a little taping on uh, this was months ago. You brought that up? Did you really? <laughs> yeah. I did. All right. All right. Yeah, I did. So let's just see what I say here. What am I going to do? <laughs> wow. Okay. So that was that, that, was, that was my reaction. Well, I gave you my reaction. I remember, I remember I haven't seen this in a while, but yeah. Well, here's my reaction of what we're going to do afterwards. Joking around, of course. I think I need discounts. Lots of discounts. Lots and lots of discounts. Heck yeah! That sounds so good. Well, you know, I was just kidding. You brought that up. Well, everybody had a reaction, right? Oh my God, what are we going to do? We're going to mark We're going to do this. I'm like, I'm going to give a lot of discounts. And he filled that stuff. That was funny. Oh my goodness. You, I can't believe you actually put that on. Yeah, I did. I did. did. You are just, just not. Well, welcome to the webinar. Yes. I mean, that's fine. But you know what? I think, and, and I'll share this, you know, as this does live, I think there's more than a few of us doctors out there who are like, okay, uh, how am I going to get my patients back? You know, if I'm supposed to be doing some sort of marketing here, what am I actually going to do? All right, I would say focus on the patients you have right now. Uh, that's why I thank you, National Recall, for being our sponsor um, for this webinar. They're a national sponsor of SI, but uh, specifically in this time, we're utilizing them effectively. They are actually um, a call service that is very well trained. And, oh my God, they, they do all of our recall, outgoing calls. Um, instead of having a full-time employee that do it, uh, they do a couple hours a day, and our hygiene is, is all three of our hygienists are swamped five days a week. Uh, but in this time, I've used them for being able to call every single one of my patient database. To say, hey, how are you doing? Just checking up on you. It's a very good service. Ah, oh, fantastic. Very good service. I just cannot speak more about them. Um, and I use them. Um, I use them. Actually, SI uses in all six of their offices nationwide. Oh, this you know, from Ohio to uh, Texas to Alabama, you know. So, you know, it's a very, very good service. So thank you, National Recall, for being such an amazing company to work with. Uh, and we can talk more a little bit about that. Um, but marketing, other forms of marketing that we did, we uh, switched to external marketing on TV. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, marketing costs have cheapened. TV has cheapened. Radio has cheapened. So we took advantage of that to brand and it's been very, very good. But once again, this right now for this webinar, it's about moving forward strong. So I don't care what you did in the past, we're all about to be unleashed. How do we get ready for it? I would bring everybody in early and I would get ready for lunch. You know what, I like that point too right there because you know what, Doc and the reason, reason I have him also a senior instructor is um, he's very successful outside the dental term, realm in terms of conditions, all right? Now, for many of the officers around out there, they think of marketing in terms of, I want to let the public know that I accept this PPO, okay? There are others who may talk in terms of uh, a fee-for-service situation. Uh, can you kind of elaborate on that? Oh, the difference between a uh, uh, fee-for-service and insurance and that kind of stuff? Yes, sir. Well, um, you know, okay, for, so a lot of doctors around the country, and I ask them how they do marketing, all mm -hmm. right? Um, and I talk to docs, I mean, I'm helping anybody. Uh, they're like, yeah, I do marketing, uh, and they talk about a really tiny little budget like Google or something like that or SEO. 
All right, that's fine. That's that's a little. But most of their marketing is I'm in network for PPOs. Which you're taking a haircut and you're on a list. Now, if you pull the data and the stats, I may have pulled this in about a year or so, it was almost at 50% of uh, consumers in your population database were on insurance. And then 50% or less was they didn't have insurance. Okay. So if your only form of marketing you're doing in your practice is I'm on network for insurance, then you, you have this certain you know population that you're all fighting for. Because everybody else, 80% oh, of dentists nice. yeah, that's are that's in that pie. pie. Mm -hmm. But this pie is not being tackled unless you're doing what? External marketing. Okay. Now, I believe in internal marketing and, and referrals and stuff like that. But <clears throat> when you got this slice of heaven out here, not even being looked at, you know, and because majority of doctors don't. And they also don't market dentures, which we, that's another conversation. Yeah, that's totally But, right. you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's time to be comfortable with external marketing. It's okay. Uh, it's what every business in the country does. So it's talk about, and so in terms of a fee for service situation, yeah, you know, I think it's very, very important to bring up to our audience. There is, uh, you one time had an office where it was what many might call a boutique office. We had a small number of patients per month, and yet you're able to be quite successful with that. Okay, um, you know, years ago, about 20 years ago, uh, I'm still in practice today. Um, is and I've modified it uh, over the course of uh, the last recession. Real expensive. Uh, it was a fee for service office. Uh, it was doing about two point seven million dollars. Uh, we had about we had to external market because so I was on a list, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to. We had to do Phoenix Magazine and, and different things like that. And it was all high end. And when when I was in my era, I guess I'm not really that old, mm -hmm. uh, forty three. But you know, during my era, when you talk about fee for service, you're talking about they're coming in your office, serving a. $1,500 check for your crown, you gotta have high-end customer service, top-of-line treatment, using the best labs, and, cause you're getting about eight to 10 patients a month. Eight to 10. That's it. And, you know, and you've gotta track anybody who leaves and anybody who comes in. Cause you've got eight leaving your office, transferring another doctor cause you're a butthole or something, and then you got eight coming in that don't realize you're a butthole, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you, you really gotta have a net zero. So, right. then that, so then that's actually very important because I think a lot of times consultants will say that the only way for your practice to really grow is you have to have 50, 60, 80, 90 patients per month. Well, you want to track the two. I mean, I, I would rather do more on less than, uh, you know, having a mill. So you don't, you don't believe in that being that addictive to hundreds of new patients plus? I don't want to be addicted to, get yeah, I don't want to be addicted to new patients. I want to get the patients I have, but I am not scared of having new patients and that's okay too. And just because you look at a practice that has hundred new patients coming in, doesn't mean that they're running a mill. Now think about it. I mean, I know doctors that have to be new patients a month that are coming in and that only do about $500,000 a year. And I'm like, the problem is actually not the new patients coming in. The problem is that they're not, the presenting treatment that you're probably looking at 20, 30% are accepting treatment. So, you know, maybe we work on operational systems, maybe we work on our business plans, but we also maybe we work on our sales techniques to create the value, um, you know, so the doctor, you know, so the patient actually accepts the solution for the challenges that you present. Well, see, I like what you just said, and one of the reasons why we have these specific uh, practice accelerators, we talked about uh, sales, sedation dentistry, restorative dentistry, implant uh, training, and bone graft. And there's a reason for that, because once this all pans out and we, we try and get back to some sort of resemblance here, is that um, there's a reason why you need these skills. What's the reason? Well, you know what? You're like talking about the reason. What's the reason? Okay. Come on, bring it to us, baby. Right. Right? right? Am I saying yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it? Yeah. Bring it out. Yeah. All right, so I pulled out uh, some stats from the uh, CDC. Okay. Okay, which nobody can really argue with. And so we think about it like this 15 to 20% of adults in a range is from 33 to 44, they have periodontal disease. All right? 30% of all adults from roughly 65 to 74 have no natural teeth. All right? 68% right? of adults, or two out of three, they have perio in this, in this age group. And 178 million Americans are missing at least one too. So how do you take stuff like that and interpret it into business? Um, my best background, what we want to do is take, okay, if you got a population that perio is increasing, your number of extractions are increasing, the number of dentures in the planet are increasing, then you've got to have every single procedure, 
you've got to be able to handle those kind of procedures. Which perio, you got to have a good perio program. So you're going to be able to handle. Well, if you've got perio, you're going to have a lot more implants, a lot more extractions. You can be more competent. At least 50 to 60 percent of them. You got to realize that the number one procedure right now are immediate placement implants, um, and you've got to be proficient at grafting. So we take a look at, and all that sales is, is you're selling a product that your population needs to fulfill the service. Well, you know, I like that point right there. And you think about it too, is that, so from what we just said about those skills, you want to know as a business person, your business person is, how, you know, if I do start doing these procedures, what does it mean to the bottom line? Because there are some of you viewers out there who are like, yeah, 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 you know, no. But what does it mean for us? All right. Absolutely. So I actually have pulled up a uh, calculator right now. I didn't know you were going to pull this up. Yeah. The, the film, it, it may not be too far away. So we're going to read this out loud. If you want to go to the website, um, what's the website on that you can actually plug in the calculator? That's well, 3i Consultants for the time being. Okay. What is it? 3i Consultants. si360consultants.com. Right. You can pull up a calculator. Can I give you a um, an idea of adding these procedures? So go go right. through it. So, we'll go through it. so this is actually based on if uh, fifty percent closing ratio. Okay. Okay. So let's just say I like. Let's just start with dentures. Okay. So if you do four dentures a month, so a right. denture is one arch. That's right. Lower arches two, upper arches three, lower arches four. So you're talking about two complete sets. That's right. All right. All right. So if you do four dentures a month or four arches, and with four implants, that's roughly a revenue of forty-eight hundred dollars a month, or fifty-seven thousand six hundred dollars a year. So if you have two sets and you get the patient <laughs> to accept two implants on the lower, which is very easy to do in this world, you're going to add fifty-seven thousand six hundred dollars to your bottom line. And that's at a low, low number that's right. from a, a, a collection point of view, 1200 bucks. That's right. And that's at a 50%. I'm gonna quite frankly tell you that doing, most patients actually want more than that. <laughs> they do, they I actually mean, do. Now, I want to talk about another thing here about extractions, because most of us do we some extractions. Not completely. So we're looking at, if you just do 10 extractions a month, and a closing ratio of 50%, that's to say five implants out of those So you offer all 10 patients, hey, Dr. S uh, Mr. Smith, you want us to place an immediate implant now and graft it? So you're saying 50% of those will say yes? Yes, absolutely. Right, okay, so you like here for each implant, that's uh, five bone grafts a month, five membranes, each of those will say bone graft about 300 bucks. Okay. Okay. Uh, membranes about roughly 300. That's $9,000. In monthly revenue or for a total of $108,000 a year. So docs, why we, we like to ask these questions is when people think about implants, they think about immediately the cost, the price, right? They're going to think about how much do I have to do to take the training and buy all this shit and then they're going to say I have to market for it. My big thing is take a look at what you're own, doing in your own practice. Do you have four dentures you're doing a month? Are you, are you extracting 10 teeth at least? Well, just kind of do the math there. I mean, doing one hundred eight thousand dollars and fifty-seven thousand is one hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars of extra revenue, and you didn't market one thing. And that's a very, very important point right there, because for some of us, if we're a little bit strapped right now because of what's happening, and you're thinking, you're listening, so like, okay, so I got to market. You know, how am I going to do that? Just use what you want. Oh, I would agree with that, and that's at a really, really low level, you know. And so, you know, just in this simple thing. When that's a total of nine a month. And the funny thing is when we teach around the country, guys, you know, we, our last class was in uh, San Francisco. We had like uh, 210 people in our audience. And we asked these doctors, how many do implants? A lot of them raised their hands. And I think about 40% didn't. Then out of that 60% that did raise their hands, we're like, how many do more than 10 a month? Hands went down. How many do five a month? Hands went up. The, the, I think the, out of 210 doctors and out of the 60% that did implants, I think it was like majority of those 60% did five or less. Yeah, five or less in this huge room. And when, then we said, well, why guys? How many extractions do you do? And then they're like, well, there's one doctor who's like, well, I do about 30 a month. And I'm like, why do you only do four a month of implants? Well, one, he wasn't trained on MBA, so that was his excuse, which is good. That's a great excuse because he was trained on, 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 um, uh, guidance, pretty right. much that was it. Otherwise, he broke a bucket plate and he was toast. Right. So, but a lot of them are not feeling comfortable. When we did a survey around, a lot of the guys are like, I'm, I'm just not really that comfortable doing, you know, they had enough 
practice. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a big thing, but the good news is for GPs, if we can do 50 to 70% of our own implants, just regular bread and butter implants, just like endo, you're not gonna struggle anymore. That's right. You, it's gonna have hand for you, just like it is right now for the faculty office right now. We're open, we're seeing patients, we're doing a lot of immediates. You know, ethically, honestly, of course, the patients that need. We're not doing fresh placements because that's mm -hmm. elective. That's right. And we're rebuilding areas and rebuilding bone and the things that, that we've been taught. And all of our SS students that took our initiative from Dr. Brown are doing well. Something to think about, guys. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so the next thing to do is, as you're listening to us, is we want to know is what does it take to get to the next level? All right. Now, in this particular photo right here. The reason why this is important is I picked uh, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant is because when Michael actually first got to the Bulls, the Bulls were not that good. Michael was always a great player from the beginning, okay? But the whole point is it took Michael quite a while before the team finally not only gelled around him, but they actually won championships. Same with Kobe. Okay, yeah, he may have had a shack and he started out you know, with a good team already, but both of these guys, uh, for the most part, for the majority of their careers, they stayed with their one team and they built up every blade around them. They became in sync. Yes, they, they knew each other's moves before they do it. Yes, they and, I, and one of a bit of a background, I teach. One, I'm part of the new sales course that's coming up, and it's team culture and team unity. I mean, the team believed in Jordan. They, they knew how he went. They knew, you know, some people call them selfish, ball hog, but he was a badass. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Kobe was a badass. That's right. But they got in sync with his moves and stuff, which was a team sport. And in dentistry, dentistry is a team sport. You know, when I'm doing revisions, and you know, my background is revision dentistry. Uh, Basically, what to answer quite what revisions are is redoing other people's shit, mm -hmm. uh, from full mouths to crazy gunshot that comes to just just really really crazy cases. Uh, and I did that until I was about 38. Uh, then I retired from that industry. Um, and I think that the best thing that I can say is I was as good as my lead assistant was with me. She made me faster and better. And I think success is given when we actually embrace our teams and let them believe in you. It's like a virus. So what you believe and perceive is what you will achieve. And you've got to have dedication and willpower. These guys didn't become investors. No, they did. You think? No, they did. What did they do? Went to the courts, they shot, they, they practiced drills, things like that. And why we like to correlate that is because A, it's, it's good to do that in your own life, but also when it comes to implants or being proficient at something, the more training or drills you do on the court, or more the live patients you get for surgeries, and implants in general, because we teach implants too, but now we teach sales and a whole bunch of other stuff, mm -hmm. <coughs> is that intensity of training. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Yes, we will. And so one of the reasons why we have this slide up right now is because, you know, when all this stuff started happening, you know, Doc and I, we've, uh, we've been very, very busy. You know, every single day, we have acted like everything's been cold. But until I look like it. <laughs> no, I actually have to tell it was. I was like, oh shit. No, that guy's a pimp. All right, so what does this guy do? Who, who respects him? I sure as heck do. Yeah. Uh, from where he came to where he went? That's right. So what does he say? He says, be the person that when your feet touch the floor in the morning, the devil says, oh shit. Oh, you see, I, I have a bad mouth, he has a good mouth. So oh my goodness. I'll just say, ah, oh, shit. All right? <laughs> but that's that's awesome, though. He he hits the ground running. That's right. A lot of people have that attitude, and I think it's contagious. And you just just grab. You want to hit with everything you have, from the way you treat your wife to the kids, to just give everything you have and give 100% and be proactive, not reactive. And when I consult and coach, you know, there's a lot of practices that are very reactive. They only handle whatever's coming in. Then there's other practices that are like, dude, we're gonna go out and get it. We're That's gonna right. do those virtual consoles, or we're gonna do a second phase. We're gonna work on our team. We're gonna go, go, go. And you're expanding in business. You have to keep on pressing that. Especially for the youngsters that are watching this web webinar that don't have a practice yet. That's the attitude you gotta have an entrepreneurial spirit. Yes, it is. And so in encompassing all these things right now, we believe in uh, ETI. Okay, which education, training, and impl implementation. All right, <laughs> no, 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 exactly. <laughs> but um, I think the reason why this is actually important is because there's a lot of um, places you go to that, let's say, get educated on these procedures. Uh, but we tend to think of it a little bit different. Well, education is important, but Doc, what do you think about in terms of training with this at the same time? 
I like, I think the only way to whoop somebody's ass is by putting them in a vice, putting some pressure, and squeezing them a little bit. It's kind of like a diamond. Mm -hmm. You got cold plus pressure, you got a diamond. And what's <laughs> happening is applying a little bit of pressure. That's you true. know, and I think, true. I mean, that's the way I've excelled in life, and that's the way residencies are. And then they're gonna grind you, and you're gonna go, oh my God, I can't breathe. <laughs> and then afterwards, you're gonna look back six months later, and you go, oh my God, I'm not even the same person. Mm -hmm. So I do believe in the way this course was designed, especially at SLI, all of our courses, mm -hmm is education and training at the same time. You know, when we, you think guys back at home when you were in dental school, you had your classes, the two years, and you're snoring, you're going, oh my God, when's it gonna be fun? And then you had your two year didactic where you hit the, uh, the clinic, mm -hmm. you know? Well, there's some schools like UOP that actually do a little mix. They educate you and then bam, you're doing a filling. And educate you on a crown, then bam, you're doing a uh, crown. And that is really, really cool. So. We, I believe, and there's some, and I know we're probably one of very few that believe in this because, I mean, I've done the, the research on it, and that a lot of them still, they do not, specifically one guy in particular, I don't agree with education training and time to interview summary. So Screw that. I want to teach you an fresh placement, and then an hour later, I'm going to beat your ass doing it. And, you know, teach you an immediate, and then go bang and do it again. And then the next day, build you up, build you up. Don't you think that? Yeah, I, I think so too, because for if you want to know what we believe on this, if you look at the interviews of any of our previous students on YouTube, I mean, from the very first day after a few hours, we have them back in the surgery room. They're placing implants, mm -hmm. all right? Because we believe you that- You shake yeah, it we, we do, day. I mean, they really are. I mean, we're looking after them, <laughs> but we do believe in the same type of testing that you and I both had in our interview. Residency. Yep. And this is what we actually bring towards our uh, towards our students. So when we bring that type of intensity to them, when they go back to their offices, when they see something like this right here on a patient, they're not as afraid or as confused when they first came to see us. Uh, true. You know, this can be an easy case. Well, you know, it's funny as uh, I get a lot of this too, especially in the, from the past. Is you have these cases that are you know overclosed bites. Uh, maybe six teeth in the front, bites over closed, no posteriors in the upper, but they have six or 11. They have their lower here, but it's over closed and they have no posteriors in the lower. And you see, uh, there'd be cases in lawsuits that would send me that the, the doctor pulled all their teeth and the patient never informed them that you can open the bite, do a design, do some implants and a full mouth rehab and never gave that patient an option. So there's a lot of times, and there's one thing that I like to teach on it is when you look at some stats, and stats are important to interpret, when you go around, and even once you agree when we've, we, we've gone around and done surveys, when we ask the doctors who's done advanced restorations, you know, CE courses, on full mouth rehabs, how to open bites, small designs, designing cases, the architecture of mouth, very, 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 very few people know Oh yeah, we would be in a room of a couple hundred doctors, and maybe... But here's the kicker. What's that? What, remember the other question we asked? How many of you guys refer to a prosthodontist? Oh, ooh. you know what? Sorry for interrupting him because I'm sorry no, right? that, but very, 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 question, very, right? very, very, no good. one. How many of you actually do that? Well, look at him, no one. And I'm like, oh, hell no, I do that shit. <laughs> you know, so, you know, if you think about it, those guys are actually trained, and now a lot of them just don't have dentures. Great, cool. Mm -hmm. I think general dentists should be doing the open bikes and the smile and signs. But if you think that the process has always been known for doing advanced cases, okay? So you know that all the GPAs are not referring, but they're also not getting the train for it. What's the level of care in the country happening? Not as good. Going down. Not as good. So that's a problem that I always want my students to recognize to start training when I teach the restorative portion, start advancing your skills in the, in the breakdown we talk about. But like this is a perfect example of, you know, what we're gonna be talking about tonight in our um, lecture. So when you look at a case like this, let's just dissect it. We're not gonna talk about the whole mouth, let's talk about the upper arch. Upper arch is toast, teeth are jacked. What I look for is, okay, are we gonna look at all this, the teeth are coming up, right? Everybody here on the webinar can probably agree. Am I gonna probably sedate this patient? Cause I got a lot of, I got a full teeth. Yeah, yes. yeah, I am anyway. You know, I mean, it helps them numb, they're comfortable. I don't care if it's mild, moderate, or completely full blown out with physiologist that's going to be done so for me I asked two what kind of restorative is this patient makes sense for his challenges that he faces so 
So I might go with this patient, hey, uh, do you want something removable? Is that acceptable for these challenges? Do you feel like that's something that would make you happy? Or are you looking for something more fixed? And is that a solution for you? And the patient may sue me to a bridge, FP1, maybe full arch, right? I'm like, okay, well, in that case, as I've chosen the question two, which is restorative, how many implants am I gonna need? Six, eight, I'm gonna need a design, capture the bike, how am I gonna do the case? And we can go through that a little bit more, but restorations to take the implant. The next question is, are we gonna graft these teeth or not? So we like to say, are we sedating the patients? What restorations are we doing? What implants are we doing? Are we grafting? And you know, one of the things that you know, when you're looking at, I like what Doc said, particularly when it comes to terms of the uh, restorations or implants, is reason being is because we look at a case like this with art, you want to think about the restoration first. Absolutely. Because there is a difference what, between uh, restorative versus surgical driven. Absolutely. So in restorative driven only, just looking at this amount, I look, 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 looking at this FMX, uh-huh. I'm looking at the amount of bone they have. You know, you switch back so the doctors can see this. Not a problem. Is switching, to the bone, the bone, he's, this guy's got a decent amount of bone. So am I gonna do a denture or an FP1? Would I consider a hybrid in the upper art? Do you guys know how much a hybrid from a space point of view has to have in order to fit a hybrid or all in four? It's actually called hybrid, or FP3. We'll, we'll tell you that in a few minutes. I'm gonna tell you the exact dimensions. And when I tell you the exact dimensions though that don't know it, you're gonna realize that you're gonna have to do some reversal damage in order to make this patient a hybrid or FP3 case. So we're going to talk about that in the restorative section. But in these cases, our students, we want you to guys be able to be proficient at doing an upper arch at one time right. in our level two course and getting the speed to be able to do both of these arches at the same time where you're knocking the patient out, you're doing surgery, you're maybe placing four up, four down, extractions, grafting, and you're following these principles. But any of these principles I still stick to when it comes to designing your cases, mm-hmm. whether you have a case like doing some crown works, fillings, a couple of implant bridges here, here. I still look at the design process and I still answer those questions. Yes, and I, again, just like we were just saying, uh, this is a perfect way, you know, to ugh, that perfect group of questions to ask when you see a sort of case like this. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, what, I, what I, when I'm teaching, what I can do a lot, a lot of guys come up with a pretty good uh, treatment plan. Mm-hmm. But then, how do you do it? They're like, oh, doc, I'll do an FB1, I'm gonna do six implants up, six implant flow, and I'm gonna take all the teeth out, top and bottom, and not, okay, great, awesome. Now how are we gonna do it? Right, and you know what? And doc said something that was very, very important here. When you said, this is what the doctor wants to do. Well, the reason why we have five acceleration now instead of four <laughs> is because you may wanna do something, but what does a patient wanna do? Right, no, that's true. And it's all about, we're not convincing something. So when we're talking about selling something, in our terms, just automatically know we're not convincing somebody to do something. We're gonna be teaching you guys how to listen to the challenges that they face and advising them on products, good or bad and ugly, level-handed, that the patient can get behind and digest. So we'll be talking about that uh, a little bit further um, in this webinar today. Well, very good. And you know, one of the things I like about having an interactive webinar like this, we talk about, we like to bounce off each other all the time, is that we actually are uh, taking some callers and we do have somebody uh, right now that actually... Is he calling in? Yeah, he or is. The, oh, he video chatted. Yeah, yeah. Look at this. Boy, we, we, we moving on up there. All right, 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 all right. It's all right. right. I hate technology. Yeah, that's right. So let's just see what this guy is saying right here. This is uh, Dr. Frank, all right? So he's making his comments. I think this is bullshit. I don't believe anything you're worth saying. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Wow. I'm not even sure exactly how to take that. <laughs> and so anybody that's doing this, do not shoot another video in because we're not going to post it. All right? Oh, my goodness. Well, so this is going to be that guy. <laughs> yeah, it looks like this is going to be Every a long class day. Has one. <laughs> Every single one. Well, we have a lot to do to raise the bar in the next sections. So thanks for listening to the intro of this webinar. That's right. Thank you very much. Hey guys, welcome back. This is sedation dentistry, it's topic one. Actually on this one, we're gonna roll from sedation into a little bit of restorative, because sedation, we are actually a Doc's education sponsored 
course, all right? Docs Education will teach you all about the medical drugs, about the drugs you use when you're doing oral conscious sedation or IV, uh, or IV sedation, quite frankly. You know, me is, Docs is an awesome course, I love them, but how many of you guys do sedation right now? Okay? How many of you guys market sedation? So sedation is actually a really good tool. I like sedation as to be able to convert my patients that need sedation. It's a marketing tool that I can go and grab patients that don't numb well, fear. I can do it for bigger cases, but also patients that have a lot of treatment. Uh, one kind of client is called a conversion patient. So if you're in hygiene and you have four or five crowns to do, I'll just tell my patient, hey, you ever tried a little ver uh, Versed? Make you mellow, you love it, they do it, they love it, they accept it all the time, just like going and get a colonoscopy. Never had one, seven years away, <laughs> and I'm not oh, off from man. So, but it's good stuff. Benzos are fantastic, and they're used in, med uh, in uh, a physician's office all the time, and dentistry is a very, very useful tool. So anyway, what I like to do is I like to break down sedation into more of a time factor. Uh, and we'll talk about marketing sedation. The types of cases we market are dentures, things like that. Uh, denture marketing is fantastic because it brings in a lot of patients, fee for service patients, that will come to your practice. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit of hint. If I get 80 patients from denture marketing, okay, and I love mailers, things like that, as long as it's consistent. If I get 80 patients that come in for thinking they need a denture, I would probably say 30 out of the 80 need a denture, 50 of them are just complex restorative cases. So a lot of my students say, how do you do all these bigger cases? Where do they come from? Denture marketing. And in business, man, none of your competition is doing marketing. If we travel around the country and we ask, that one question, how many of you guys in the room actually market dentures, we don't get a raised hand. So in business, we call that an opportunity. I don't know why dentists don't see that. So I'm always promoting to my doctors, market, market dentures. Fantastic, fantastic. And it will give you an edge in the marketplace. And don't worry about it. You're probably looking at about 60%. Broke one or two teeth. They need some complex restorative. And as long as you can handle that load, those are the kind of patients you're gonna get. So anyway, working through this, what I like to do is um, sedation is based on speed. Speed and time working them out. So if I'm sedating a patient, my team knows exactly how much restorative dentistry or implants or what I'm doing, I can do in a lot of time. So, you know, if I'm doing eight units, they know that's Dr. Chaffin, it's a simple case, I know allotted. We're gonna go on the next screen. I will call that simple hour to hour and a half in the mouth max for me. So I'll take the time to take the patient, do the treatment, and then I'll move on to the next. Okay, those are simple cases, two to eight crowns. Moderate cases, eight to 10 units, okay? Eight, eight units on the upper, eight units on the lower. Moderate cases are two hour maximum for me. Complex cases are like full arch, full mouth, uh, full mouth open bite type cases, and those can be two to three hours uh, for myself. Now, the reason why I keep saying myself is when you start doing sedation and you start improving your speed, whether it used to take you 45 minutes to place one implant, now it takes you three minutes, right? Or you're prepping 10 unit veneers, or you're prepping a whole upper arch and it used to take you four hours, now it takes you an hour. You really, in prosthodontics, really want to increase your speed so you're utilizing and you're being more surgical. Boom, you get things done fast, effective, and perfect. So this is some of the training that I teach here at the Institute to make sure my students know what to go, what to learn, how to practice to improve their restorative skills. Okay? Sedation, you are either, you are either getting better or getting worse, but you are never staying the same. And in dentistry and in life. So if you start doing crowns now, if you guys look back, you are probably way the hell faster and better at doing restorative work. Okay? So we're gonna go through some simple cases here that we like to do, um, and we're gonna continue on, and I'm gonna kind of uh, you know, go through simple, and then I'm gonna show you a case, and all that kind of good stuff. You know, Don, as we always do, we actually have somebody that's emailed us on it. We got another, who's this at? Uh, this is another patient right here. Let, let, Dr. Frank. Yeah, let's, let's see. What Was he, he asking asked, another question? Yeah, I think so. All right. All right, let's see what he's gonna say. I'm not totally sure about this. Um, whole sedation things with drugs, they may not be um, <laughs> safe. And um, I, I don't know, I'm not gonna uh, kill my fucking patient. I mean, can you guarantee me that, please? Can I guarantee you're not gonna kill your patient? Oh. 
Uh, no, I can't actually. No, actually, what I can do is yeah, with uh, benzos and being trained by Doctor Education. Yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> to I to this guy. No more questions. <laughs> Nobody said any more shit in. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> can you guarantee? Well, one thing I can guarantee is that if you go to doctor's education and you get trained on oral sedation or IV sedation, you're going to know how to properly administer the drugs safely, consistently, over and over, okay? What we're going to teach here, what I teach here specifically, is how to actually work on a sedation patient, okay? One, to know how to sedate. Two, is actually be able to perform sedation, whether in the hospital, whether in an outpatient, whether you do oral, whether you do an IV what sort of sponges to use, how to keep them isolated, how do you keep them swallowing, you know, different stuff that you're doing, okay? Because dentistry can be a dirty job. So, how do you work effectively and efficiently? When you have a sedation patient, you gotta work quick. When I'm at the hospitals and things, I'm doing big ass cases, I do not have five hours to fart around, okay? Just to be quite frankly honest, so. And you know what, Doc, and what I like about that is in an institute, we actually can give you sedation training and experience. In the mouth. Every one of our students get to actually get to experience multiple sedations during their stay here with us. So the key with sedation is to, we, we broke up just to reiterate, simple, moderate, and complex sedation cases. That's how I break it up, and my team knows it. And th those will change as you get faster. So you want to get into sedation, you need to know time-wise. Key about time, guys, is you always plan you case design with wax ups and architectures. So if you guys don't know what wax ups are, one nickname is smile designs. Take some impressions, you pick out smiles, you show if you're doing the front. But you know, architecture plans are the basis of the mouth. I mean, let's say you have a good vertical mention, everything's good in the front, they have a large curve of speed, which you guys have all had, by the way. You notice that they're all crown work in the back, okay, because the curve of speed is just jack. Well, if you smile and design it, you can do both top crowns and bottom crowns, and raise and correct the horizontal vertical plane. Wow, that's kind of cool. It's not necessarily full mouth. But before you do that, you want to design it. And when you design it, you get all the matrices and the temps and all the things you need to do. And if you're sedating the patients, that's what you need to work really effectively. So anytime you're changing things, vertical dimension, what width, or any of that garbage, smile designs, but I design all my cases. You know, sedation suggestions to speed you up. Surgical sponges are great. Practice your speed. When it comes to complex dentistry, which is my background, I guess, it is design, prep, seat. So I don't care if I'm doing an upper arch, design, prep, seat. If I'm doing a full mouth, design, prep, seat. Veneers, design, prep, seat, okay? If I'm doing a case that I have 10 unit crowns in the front, but two of them are implants, I'm gonna design, surgical appointment, prep, implants, hold, then seat, okay? So these are some concepts that we teach here at SI that I always like to show my doctors. Okay, so it's a one, two, three approach, design prep seat. So here's a case example of a moderate sedation case. In the picture here, you see a smile design wax up. This is what one looks like. We take an impression of an upper arch. Obviously here, we chose and designed the smile. If you don't have smile design training, go to a course, find out exactly how to use those smile design books so you're controlling the case, not letting your local general lab doing it. That's terrible. You want to actually control the entire case from start to finish. The next picture here is temporaries. Once you have the design done, you've got beautiful temporary matrices where you can do a technique called locking in your temporaries. These guys that don't do locking techniques, I have no idea why. They're pulling things out, they're taking those little displays and they're taking forever today to do anything. When you have a smile design done correctly and you have a prosthodontic lab do the work, this stuff, money. Not a lot of flash, you lock them in, they're not falling out, beautiful work. And we'll show you some of that aspect there. This is a case from that smile design I showed you previously that I did. I specifically did this for my students. I wanted to show them how to two-stage a treatment plan. So this was basically almost an upper arch. The patient had some spaces here and here. She needed crown work. So I designed it, I prepped it, I held. So when I got back from the lab, it had all these units Plus, they made me a valve to put in at the same time to hold the space so I could bring the patient back on a second phase for implants. That's called staging your treatment plan, very technique. For me, what I do is I like to prep and place at the same time. I specifically did this one for demonstration. 
um, the patient was happy, but you can notice that the aesthetic components are under my control and I absolutely think they're gorgeous, okay? So, next case I'm gonna do. This is a larger case. So is this complex? Now take a look at the picture here, guys. What do you guys see uh, uh, viewing from home? What sedation tape is this? What restorative type case is this? Do you do any implants on this case? So from this picture, you guys can only see you've got vertical collapsation, right? Look at these teeth. You guys are like, OMG. <laughs> Those are jacked. okay? Well, let me just tell you, this guy had these teeth in the front. He had posterior teeth back here. He had no teeth on the bottom here, and he had no teeth in the front. That's why he got vertically collapsed. This is the kind of case that I see a lot of GPs just, how to make the case simple, palm all, denture, okay? Well, this guy actually happened to be around six different people, and one of the guys referred him to me, uh, specifically his attorney, so I actually redid a, the case for him, okay? So, next picture here is what I've done. I've opened the guy's bite. And hold on with the slide here. You can slide up here on your, your duck. Okay, here's the x-rays for you guys to view before I show you this stuff. Remember I was telling you about the lower here? He's got his lower teeth here. He's got his upper posterior teeth here, in here, none in the back, vertical mention drop. So when you guys look at home, this is why I always like my students or doctors that I'm coaching to continue to advance their training. If you've never done a full arch, this is not a kind of case you want to attempt. If you never know how the vertical opening changes to do it predictable so you don't simulate myofascial pain or have any issues when it comes to that, don't attempt a case type five case where you're doing a full mouth with opening bite. You need to kind of learn restorative dentistry in phases, getting up to full arches and be able to do full mouth with no vertical opening before you attempt this stuff, okay? So here's, I did a design prep C. I know I'm going pretty quickly, but this is a short webinar. Smile wax up low, smile wax up high. I open the bite, as you can kind of see with this action bite transfer. And this is my guides for conservative preparations. Okay, now what did I do? What I did at that first appointment is I opened the guy's bite, I captured a bite, I did an upper lower impression, designed his entire mouth, architecture comes back, this is what I get. Now it's ready for surgery day. Okay, so the next slide is gonna show the next surgery. Now, this is the transfer bite, okay? Remember I said I designed the bite, so when I got all that crap back, I put this in his mouth to check that I like the vertical and the positioning. Patient felt comfortable, but look how much more space I have. I got more space? Oh, yeah. Now, looking at these teeth here, anybody that's viewing this would go, I don't, I mean, I, what do I do? Do I pull these? If you pull the front teeth and don't put implants in, it's hard to do emergent profile gum contouring so he looks just like he did when he came into you. Does that make sense? Because when you pull everything, you're losing all the scalp and borders. So in this case, it was really, really important for me to be able to pull these teeth and place the implants in the positions that I wanted for the bridge work in the front. Because I was doing bridge work in the front, crowns, crowns, implants with crowns, full mouth. Okay, so after I opened his bite, this is the day of surgery. Look at those tabs. Proud of those? This guy's kind of glossy eye, but that's his new bite. Those are temporaries at the new vertical. I've already done all my implants at this point. I've done all my crown preparations at this point, top and bottom. I have them stabilized. Remember when I said when you do implants, you do prep, then I hold. I held for eight weeks for everything to take. I went into final prosthetic, seating the mouth at one time. Okay? So, next case, this is a little easier case. You guys get these cases all the time. Number uh, eight comes in, you have to pull the sucker out, right? Not a problem, and actually I did this case, by the way. <clears throat> I stopped and did the implant first just so for demonstrative purposes. You guys can kind of see the little knot in the front, the little suture. I did that on purpose and I'm gonna show you why. During the conversation with the patient, and she not only broke the front tooth, but she hated her teeth. Now, we don't see it, she has some, some decay, she had some cervical erosion, she hated her smile, she only had done this a couple years back, but that was important to her. So at that point, I communicated my patient, she decided she wanted the front tooth fixed and 10 unit work up on the anterior area. 
So I did a small design, design prep seat, right? So this is the day of surgery. You saw it before, I pulled the tooth, I placed the implant, put a membrane, back it up one side, and I put the suture here. Then I went and prepped these teeth. Then, go to the next slide, Doc. I now have my temporaries. You'll notice some gum line redness, okay? Anybody tell me what that is? Switch it back so you guys can see the gum contour. Look at these gum lines. I call it the M&M. How do you make this thing aesthetically wonderful? Gum contouring. So go back to the other thing. I was able to contour the profile here with this. So I've got a beautiful temporary. These are locked in temporary, so they're gloss and glaze. I did gum contouring. So this is exactly what it's gonna heal like, and this is exactly what the aesthetic components are gonna look like. So I'm trying to take it up a notch for you guys, okay? This was all done under sedation as well. So always look at everything, okay? So sometimes people ask me, well, well doc, what do you do if you have a sedation patient and they broke all the crap in the front teeth? This guy happens to be one of the big shots at CBS in San Diego. He drove all the way to see me. He was on a wedding, broke his teeth on the front. Walked in like that, you can see the scar on the top. So, I at that point don't have enough time to do a smile design. And you don't want to trust the assistant doing temporaries on this, do you? Remember, every temporary that you do reflects you. The aesthetic components and everything you are about your practice. Takes a pride in that. So at this point, I did a direct wax up, which means I built out a composite. It only took me about 10 minutes. Composite in the patient's mouth, and I charged them for it. So you can see this is, I actually purposely made it a different color. I built all these up, contoured it. Is that acceptable? Yep. Took my impressions from my matrices for my temporaries. Then I went to prep. I prepped them and I put them in locked in temporaries, gloss and glaze. He went on his way back to San Diego that same night. So that is kind of a cool method. It has nothing to do with implants. Will we get another call in? I think so. Ah. Uh. I told you, this guy keeps keeping coming, uh, doesn't he? I know, I know, it's called. All right, Dr. Frank. All right, let's see what's going on. On a serious note, um, yesterday I had, I had an MODFQL uh, buildup on 18, and then I had 19, I had a crown. The patient came in about 8 o'clock and I left about 4.30. Can this help me increase my speed? I really, really, really need to know. Thanks for your advice. Appreciate it. I think he's kind of warming up to us. I, I think so. It's getting nicer. <laughs> Dr. Frank, if you're watching this, uh, thanks for being a little nicer this time. Um, to answer your question, your patient was in at 8 and left at 4.30. Um, was he doing brain surgery at all? I don't know. Um, <laughs> how, do you, how do you answer that? <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> God help you, because I'm sure it's not here. All right? <laughs> Sedation won't speed you up, okay? It's just a pleasant way for a patient to have great care and not remember anything here, Dr. Frank. So the speed's going to come from you actually pushing yourself to do things faster. Put yourself under pressure. Time the next time you do a crown. So if you're doing a crown on 19 and you're doing an MFQZBY buildup on uh, 18, um, you might want to think twice. And good luck with yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Next, okay. So this is one of my last, so you guys see I'm crossing into restorative dentistry a little bit. This is a bigger case, okay. This is actually a case I got with physique from Mayo Hospital. This gentleman blew half his jaw off here. The oral FMS team stabilized him, put him in the half hybrid, which I'll show you. You guys are used to full arch hybrids. This stuff has been around for years. This is a GP bar, denture teeth, crappy acrylic, looks like toast. You can see up here, he's got some exposed recession areas for implants. These teeth have some decay in them. So I got referred this case. So what do I know, guys? Design prep seat, okay? So what am I gonna do with it? Took impressions, designed them, grabbed my parts for the implants, did the things, case planned it out. The next thing, we sedated the patient, and I did the surgery. Pulled everything off. Go to the next slide, Doc. And one thing I wanted to show you, and hopefully you guys can see this, is the drop from this canine straight down. This is the portion where the gentleman kind of blew his jaw off a piece of the shotgun. It was rebuilt. These little things right here are called multi-units. 
Okay, now if you don't know what a multi-unit is, you will, be you will know by the time our course is done, and it's a way to correct angulation so you can actually seat things. Hybrids typically have multi-units to correct any angulation so it can seat in a passive way. So, on to the next, I took another picture here. This is PFM bridge work. You see the straddling here? Porcelain's gonna be stacked up here and modified acrylic. Really high grade acrylic or pressed pink porcelain is gonna be bought, done here. I designed this case to be off the tissue, also to be a permanent prosthetic, because hybrids are a semi-permanent prosthetic, okay? So here is the day, uh, this is the actually seating the case. I did full upper arch, crown bridge. I replaced this hybrid with a uh, modified bridge FP1, and I did crown work, so I was able to keep the scum contour. Now, if you can look closely here, there's a gap between underneath this guy had Parkinson's, so one of his problems was he was collecting saliva. So I purposely lifted off the tissue to clean. So you guys are getting to understand that half of these kind of cases are designing these cases and thinking about all the aspects. Now this is kind of an extreme case, very challenging case. Full IV sedation on this guy. Cool, all right? So <clears throat> that is some of the sedation, restorative half section. And we're gonna go in the next section to restorative two, and we're gonna talk about the fab three. Anything that went? That went good. Because you were uh, you were sore. Hey guys, this is the section of restorative two. The first section we just got done with was all about implants in combination with teeth. That's some of our restorative section where we're designing and all that kind of stuff. This is a restorative tooth section where we're talking about when a patient's losing all their teeth. So I want you guys to be able to keep two categories. Implants with teeth, losing all your teeth. So this is the section that Dr. Brown and myself promised you. That's right. Fab three, yeah! All right, so to make it easy, fab three, dentures, okay, hybrids, FP1's bridges. bridges. Okay. Now FP1 is a mish designation. It's fantastic. Call it a bridge, call it a screw retain bridge, whatever you like. Mm -hmm. Okay, but those are the three options that are going around today. We're gonna go through this. So here is a FMX. Here's one of the FMX we showed you earlier. This guy is losing all their teeth. One could argue watching the webinar, you may be able to save. This is actually a real case, and we're gonna actually tell you that they were not savable. Okay? And but in general, if you're gonna lose all this these teeth, you know the patient's losing all these teeth. What do you look for? First thing, bone. What I'm gonna design my prosthetic is based on what the bone looks like, what it is, okay? So this is the kind of patient, if you've got pretty decent bone, a little bone here, but pretty decent bone here, decent bone up here, got a lot of bone, I wanna keep it really simple. You can either be denture or a bridge. Make sense? Okay, a denture you can fit in about anywhere, and an FB1 you can fit in about anywhere. If you've got a little slight bone loss, you can cover it up with pink porcelain. Okay, hybrids are another thing we'll talk about in a second, but remember, out of the Fab Three, people usually can only be two of the three. So if you've got good bone, you're a denture or you're a bridge. If you've got shit bone, you're either a denture or a hybrid. Those are your choices. Yes, because you can never be all three. Absolutely not. I like this also is when people look at these cases, they're like, oh my God, docs, you guys are gonna be like, we're talking the implant section a little bit in a few minutes, but I'm gonna give you some previews. <clears throat> when you're a surgeon and you're actually placing and taking all these teeth, a lot of doctors are like, well, how are you supposed to have Dr. C or Dr. Brown, can you put five implants or six implants down there in about 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. Well, there's different techniques that Dr. Brown's gonna show you. One is called the drillist technique. Any of these, and we'll go through with it, any of these roots are great candidates to be able to slam in implants. And by the time you get done with this little lecture he's gonna be giving, you're gonna understand why. So there are different techniques to speed up. And when we're looking through surgical processes, we do want to think about speed of placement. Yes, we do. General dentists typically, just in general, oversize everything. Us as implant doctors, we actually give you three different ways to skin a cat. So we don't go in with the biggest, longest thing we have. Okay, so it gives you a little hint. Next slide, this is the another example, guys. Is this guy losing all his teeth? Absolutely. 
All right, does he have a lot of bone? Hell no, right? Now, what is the two options for him? Dentures, hybrids. Now, we're gonna show you what a hybrid looks like and stuff, or the technique all in four. But what you're looking for is because the bone used to be here, and now it's here. You have the space to put in that prosthetic. A hybrid has to be 17 to 22 millimeters per arch of space. It's got it, right? Okay, so now you know that this, the bone of the patient is detrimental bone. You do have enough room right now with no reduction of bone to be able to put it in. The previous slide that we showed you, how much bone would you have had to remove in order to fit the prosthetic in? And that is what we have a problem with, is doing reversible damage, irreversible damage, to a patient to fit a prosthetic in their mouth. So we look at bone first and go, hmm. Now if we have slight bone loss, we go denture, or maybe modified bridge, which we're gonna show you, and that's modifying a bridge to make it aesthetic and beautiful. Now, about implants, uh, about implants here. Can my students and our students here place implants in here? Absolutely. You have God's own guide. Normal hybrids that walk in your office have really crappy bone, no teeth, tough cases, challenging cases, some of the cha most challenging cases that it can be. So there's a lot of companies that will promote these doctors. Oh boy. Get into surgical driven, oh all in fours, all in fours, all in fours. If you talk to any oral facial maxillary surgeon on the planet, they hate hybrids. It's detrimental shit bone. Mm -hmm. It's the last resort. So if you're brand new into implants, that's the last thing I care about you doing is the placement of the implant placement for a hybrid. And you know what, Doc? And I like that point right there because a lot of times when doctors are learning this thing, they're thinking, well, I'm going to place the implant and I'm going to do the restoration also. Absolutely. I don't... What do you think about that? I think it's a big risk. Like reconstruction, so... Yeah. I'm now, just asking. <laughs> just because you can doesn't mean you should. And specifically with hybrids, did this guy get this way overnight? Do you think he's got good hygiene technique? No. Okay? So, when you think about taking all the teeth out and placing these implants in on the last resort type patients, okay, and some of these patients, if the implants fail down the road, what do you do next? That's all of a mess. Psychomatics. Ooh, yes, it is. But let's say you can place the four in a really, really challenging case and then do this $15,000 prosthetic called a hybrid, whether it's a GP bar acrylic hybrid or you upgrade it to zirconia or get crazy with it, which there are a lot of really cool designs for hybrids. Mm -hmm. What happens if one of those implants fail? Ooh. It's already crap bone and failed. You were probably not gifted enough, most of them are not, to even some of these ones were like, uh uh to rebuild the bone in order to get another one in. Do you think you're gonna be doing that for free with your patient? If you just place four implants in a hybrid, a year later one fails, you're gonna take the prosthetic out, you're gonna to have to get him placing another implant. If you That's can't right. do it yourself, you're gonna to refer to a role surgeon. He's That's gonna right. charge you to place the implant. You think your patient's gonna say yes to paying it again? No, and then when you tell him that you have to remake the prosthetic and he can cover lab charges or charge them again, you're gonna be eating crow. That's right. Ooh. Okay, if like you that. separate it out, OFMS does this, you do a beautiful job. Let's say three years down the road, one implant fails. Go back to the oral surgeon. Uh, well, we're gonna have to make your prosthetic. Mm -hmm. You see the difference, guys? And you're not eating. So this is where on surgical teams, when I was a part of a surgical team, I was the cross guy. I worked with OFMS, Perio, Endo, really uh, plastics, all that kind of good stuff. And we split shit up because you know what? Sometimes you don't want the liability. Okay. Now, I do promote oh, FB1s nice. doing with our students. That's a flipping movie. Okay. And the key question on that, if you back up one dot for sure. FB1s, is if you have a case that's like the previous slide, actually, you have to back it up on that. Yeah. Like this, how do you actually know how to take them from this into an FB1? So you're like, okay, doc, six implants, FB1. Patient's like, absolutely, let's do it. I'm ready to spend 30 grand, absolutely. Yeah. So now, how do you do it, right? Just because you diagnose it doesn't mean you can do it. So what we like to teach our students here at SI is how to be able to extract, we'll just concentrate on one arch. Mm -hmm. How to A, what? Design the case, capture bite. Get all the stents and matrices. Tell the lab to give me immediate denture. Day of surgery. 
Go place your hand plants. Place six of them. Maybe throw some backups. Mm -hmm. Seven and eight. Mm -hmm. If you get good primary stability over a torquing spectrum, you can actually now, because you designed it, making them an immediate temporary screw retain right on top of those implants. Keeping the profile, merchant profile, with your temporary. If you can't, you've got your backup denture made at the vertical to always put them in. Eight weeks later, take off your uh, healing caps or, or uncover your implants, take out the denture. You've already designed your case. Now you can make a screw retain temporary. Beautiful eight weeks from now. Awesome. So either way, you've thought things through. Now we go through that quite significantly. Mm -hmm. Okay? Anything good. you want to add to that? You said I would yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. This is a webinar. I'm yeah. trying to give you guys some stuff. Yes. So let's go through a couple of the uh, pictures here. <coughs> Remember, and this is actually my ex-wife. Oh! <laughs> Ew. Ew. No, I'm kidding, guys. No, she <laughs> Anybody knows what we're talking about? Yeah, but would it be your ex? <laughs> so this is the kind of stuff that you get that are in fitting these categories. This guy has severe bone loss, so he's probably a denture or hybrid. That's right. All right. This is not going to get better just because you pulled out the teeth. Mm -hmm. His skills take time to improve. Mm -hmm. okay? hey, and you know, you made a great comment because regardless of whatever treatment this patient is going to get, you want to work on them with the hygiene because even, again, if you place all of this, they're not going to magically overnight and just start to keep things clean. So that's always very, very important. You make your hygienist happy. And make sure you guys tell your patients to do it hybrids, especially if it's GP bar hybrids. It's a semi-permanent prosthetic. You have got to have it taken out. We're gonna charge you to take it out. We're gonna clean it. We're gonna change the screws. And then we're gonna put it back in. The maintenance fees on a hybrid, especially the GP hybrids, are a little bit more costly. So there's other techniques that we can show you that will improve those case outcomes. And be very, very cautious on taking over somebody else's hybrid. That's right. Because you've done a lot of revisions in your career. Yeah, I've a lot of them. hybrids and all of your screw was stripped and we're doing retrievals. And oh, all that's it. So you always make sure before you touch somebody else's screw, listen, Mrs. Patient, here's my little assistant tool. I can't strip it. I'm going to go check to see if the screw is not stripped. If it's stripped, I didn't strip it. If it's not, then you can go and but replace them all anyway. Little tip. So. Next thing is, what does the denture look like? You guys are already like, uh, all right, here's a denture. We have immediate conventionals and over dentures. We have to go through it, keep going down. We also go through the different type of attachments that are available from locators to things like this. This is a hater bar attachment. It's great because it's basically an over denture palletless that actually is not tissue borne. It is straight up on those mm -hmm. and patients really love it. The bar actually corrects, actually this is one of our cases, mm -hmm. corrects any angulation of the four implants that you place. Mm -hmm. Talk further about And excellent for someone that also has dexterity issues. Completely. Straight in, slam. Four implants with locators can be a little bit challenging. Okay? Here's the attachments for those uh, hater bar clips. On this, we actually show this picture above the girl's nose because this piece for acrylic comes right off her tissue. Mm -hmm. So patients really, really like it. Um, actually quite significantly. So, next question. Here is a hybrid. This is just a general picture. These are our multi-angle abutments on top of four implants. These are the housing. Now in that is a big bar. These are denture teeth with acrylic, but basically a glorified denture. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's pretty expensive for a glorified denture. All right? You wanna go through this one? You guys uh -huh. see this circle right around? So you know what? Just want to think about it like this. For those of you that are thinking about doing one of these all on fours, all right, this is what is going to have to happen if the patient, if you have to make the prosthetic fit. So what I was talking about before, we always look at bone and find out what is easily done. This is what's going on in the world today because hybrids all on four teeth in a day is a fad. Mm -hmm. So they're taking patients that have a lot of bone, removing the bone down to fit the prosthetic in, they usually take the teeth out first, hack the bone down. So you have these 360 guide companies show you these guides and then you put them on and you just plane it down. That is irreversible damage. You go to court on that, you're totally screwed. 100%. That's right. And that's the very reason why earlier we were talking about who refers to props. Because when we talk about the level of restorative knowledge is going down, when that knowledge goes down, how are the doctors going to end up doing bigger cases this is what happens so like this. And what happens too is this is actually an oral surgeon. This is a real case. Mm -hmm. The oral surgeon wanted a show, which I, I don't know who it is. 
But normally when people are reducing the bone, you'll see them pull the teeth, flap it, get these guides, whack right. it down so it doesn't feel as bad. This is actually a real, real example. You flap the tissue and you're removing everything at one time and this is what it is. You're left with reduced bone, you pluck out the root tips and then you go on with your surgery. Right. But when you take it out at one, does this scare the hell out of you? Because it should. Yeah. This is a fad. Mm -hmm. Hybrids were around for over 40 years. This is a fad and it just happens to be a decent technique that somebody's taking control over and this is what you want to be cautious. You either are a hybrid candidate or you're not. I'm not going to make you one. All right? Okay. So let's show them a little bit more what a hybrid looks like. This is a hybrid, the bottom of it. You can see the little housings. This is a uh, acrylic with denture teeth. I showed this picture because it's really flat. What you want to do if you're ever restoring for an oral surgeon, do, make, do not make a saddle type hybrid because they will collect food and they'll cause failure. This is actually four years after me doing it. It's nice and clean. The patient goes back. And I rarely do these types. I usually go into other alternatives. All right? <clears throat> this is a modified bridge, an FP1 modified. You notice I have some pink porcelain here. So this is a case where I had a lot of bone, but the patient already had enough recession where it wasn't aesthetically going to be perfect for a traditional where I could profile the gums. So I was able to hide the gums on the front by masking it, but on the back, it's like a traditional bridge. This is a permanent prosthetic, not a semi. Okay? Here's a lower, okay? This is actually on the same patient. This is actually mm -hmm. one of my cases, all right? This is actually another high, uh, uh, FP1, and this is porcelain, pink acrylic to actually hide it, or pink porcelain. And you notice right here in this video, you guys can scoot a little further, mm -hmm. is you'll know the insertion is on the facial. Now, I didn't do these implants. That's right. This was a Hollywood case that I did a revision on for uh, one of the engineers that did the uh, set of the Italian job. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to redo it because Basically, GP opened his bite up, put a regular hybrid in there. It was too much. The room for this is a hell of a lot less than 17, 22 millimeters. He walked in my office with two big things in his mouth. The oral surgeon reduced bone. Great. Love that guy. The GP didn't recognize, so he put this prosthetic in his mouth and the patient could open up and only fit one thing. Yeah, I remember that was something else. He had too much prosthetic in his mouth, so it didn't cause damage, but the patient was having TMD issues and mild facial pain. I had to take it out, reset the bite, and replace it with a proper positioning prosthetic that it didn't have as much clearance, therefore he had a lot more room. Well, the reason why I show this is because you can get creative in dentistry. Obviously, I'm not going to fill this with composite. You guys ever had a crown where your, your insertion, where you're going to torque is in the facial? Well, we're going to seat this in the patient's mouth with cotton roll and a little white wax, and we have a veneer made to put right on top of it. Now, but do we show the final outcome here? Yes, we do. <clears throat> so you can see that everything is nice for this patient. We have the backing. Here's the back. Profile's just like a regular bridge. You can see the insertion. This is for the top arch. Very cool stuff, guys. All of our students should be able to do these cases. There are more patients that need these than hybrids. Okay? Very, very interesting fact. So dentures and, and FP1s are a huge, huge practice builder and patients will love you for it. All right. Implant dentistry. <laughs> All right. All right. So I am up. Thanks for listening, by the way. Dr. Brown. Hey, all man. right. So we're going to talk a little bit about implant dentistry right here. And there's actually a couple of procedures that really we like to focus on. And one, I would say, is immediate placement. And the second one is a drillless technique. Now I'm going to have you watch a couple videos in just a moment so that you can see exactly what we're talking about right here. Alright, and here's our first video here. It's media placement number eight. It's time for the extraction. This is real time placement right here. And notice where we put the pilot drill, more pilot in place. So I 
saw with my palette, how it'll slightly plow beyond the apex, two, three to four millimeters. All right. So on there is one of my intermediate drills, probably a two eight. See, in our course, when we teach our students this, we actually teach you how to do this very, very safely. As you know, without a guide, you should be able to place an implant like this in really less than two to three minutes, tops. So right now, by listening to the sounds, I'm actually popping an implant out already. Look how much time is it taking. It's not taking any time at all. It's one of my favorite uh, tools in the world. How long has it been so far? What, maybe 20 seconds if that? The implant is in already. Look at that. Place exactly where it's be placed. You see, when I place it really fast, I'm going to jump up and down a little bit so my camera might move around a little bit. But look at this. I'm actually right now, the same tool, I'm actually tightening that implant. And I'm liking my position so far. If I take my driver, my tool, and I'm twisting, make sure I get good stability. That's good. Suction. So I'll slightly blow the press the bone. right there. Ideal placement, all right? Temporization. We're going through this. It's a beautiful procedure. Implant was nice and stable. Bone graft plate all around the implant. Making a temporary procedure, you should be able to do all day long. And of course, we actually take you through, our students get a chance to do one of these, all right? Fantastic, it's a very, very nice procedure. Basically, polishing the surface, because when the implant is placed, the surface look, listen to this. Uh, temporary, that's connected to your equipment, and you just kind of insert that straight onto your implant. Now you have the contour, and it's all nice and tissue. You're able to keep the contours of your normal gum structure of number eight. So what he's gonna do now is torque it down, repair some of that insertion on that subtle edge, and then this patient is done. Now look at this right there. That was beautiful, all right? Beautiful, beautiful. I'm gonna show you something here. That's a procedure that you can do all day long, all right? When we start thinking in terms of implant dentistry, a lot of times, instead of thinking about just the all on four of these bigger cases, you can actually, actually just do something like this, all right? Patients love this procedure because it helps them to actually feel whole. And this is one of the procedures that every single one of our students gets a chance to do when they come to the Institute. You know, it's so funny sometimes because we go through some of these technical things, but it's all right, it's all good. So now, the most important picture for that whole last video, if I was actually going to freeze frame or something similar to this, is this point right here. Because I know there's a lot, there's, there is a certain camp right now that says that if you are doing any sort of immediate, particularly in the interior, that you have to do it with a guy. Well, you know what? We can actually teach you how to properly place a dental implant without actually having to use a guy because God often, he provides the best guy 
if I just threw two socket right there, all right? You take your pilot drill and you go right along the pallet. That is the exact placement of where you wanna place your implant. And as you saw really in that last video, I mean, the whole procedure, I mean, it was edited in some small way, but the whole procedure takes, can take less than a half hour. But that implant placement, that was real time. That was barely two minutes. An implant was placed exactly where we wanted it to be placed. So um, do we use guys? Yes, we do it in faculty practice, but for the most part, in a situation like this, once the tooth is taken out, this is what we do. We do this all day long. Okay, um, I, I think maybe in some Got a video way, in for you. Oh, okay. Um, I think some small way, because of my little technical di difficulty that I had, I think uh, Dr. Frank is probably going to curse me out and say something that he's probably really gonna hurt my feelings this time. I I'm just anticipating that. But you know what? I'm just gonna give it a shot and let's just see what uh, Dr. Frank has to say. Dr. Frank, this is Dr. Frank. I just wanted to tell you a nice job so far. Dr. Chaffin, slow it down. You get me, son? Slow down. Dude, did he just talk some smack? I think I think he did. But I, I feel a little bit better because I had a little glitch there for a second, but he was supportive. Dude, you well, we, we were raising. <laughs> Dr. Frank, we appreciate it. Here he is. Doc, thank you so very, very much. <laughs> so, but like as I was talking about a minute ago, and this is actually one of Dr. Chapman's cases, all right? The next procedure we talk about is a drillist technique. Oh, shit. Like it's a very beautiful technique. So, uh, Let's just see what we can do right here for, for everybody. Hey guys, this is Dr. Chapman. I want to show you a technique called the no-drill implant. We're going to look at this x-ray right here. On the top of the apex of that tooth there, the premolar, we have already extracted. Above that apex, you can see the sinus. So we don't have a lot of apical bones. How do you place this implant? What we're gonna do is we're gonna choose an implant that's slightly wider and slightly shorter than the original socket. So the socket is about 10.6 length and the width is about 3.4 millimeters. On the coronal portion of that uh, root, it's about 4.2. Let's look in the mouth here real quick. And we're gonna show you what to look for. So in the mouth, the buccal lingual width, that is about, nine millimeters width. So when we put an implant in, we don't want to engage this plate. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to place a no-drill implant. This is a five by ten. Excellent. So, first thing that you do, you clean out the socket in the section here, which has already been done from Dr. Green. Suction on it. Make sure everything looks pretty nice and good. Make sure that the sock is nice and uh, cleaned out of the uh, fibrous tissue. Uh, right. We're going to do a no-drill implant. You want to insert this right in the center, not engage, and it's going where I want it to go. Right. Okay. No drill. Feel the tightness there, right in the center. Pop that off. So How long does that take? Direct. So you can see that now, since the apex is really nice and tight, right in the center, I'm gonna be thinking about the top portion of the implant. So I'm gonna do it, and just continue to press in. Just crush that bone with that instrument. Nice implant is going to the floor. If I want to, I'm tilted, I can always guide it where I want to The most important part, you so can control the guide. Is. implant is right below the crustal bone. When you plate, buckle plate, easier for you. Okay? So it's right at the level, but I probably want to get a little deeper just in case we ask for a session. So as you can see, the implant is pouring in. Good positioning. Suction there. 
right side of the boiler crest. Okay? Now, how many of you don't think you can't actually do that? Very so simple. Memory on top, and we are done. That is a no go implant technique. You see how long that took? It didn't take probably any time at all. What I'm doing is I'm, we just place a no drill implant. Now, what I'm going to be doing is putting them back together. So, what do we do once we place the implant in? Well, in this particular case, I'm going to put, I'm placing a cover screw, which is this thing, to cover the interface. Okay, and that's going to protect the top of the implant. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pack bone around it. And after I pack the bone, I have a couple choices. I can either place a membrane on top of it. Very or, just packing some bone. I can actually, in this case, possibly put a healing cap on it. And I'm packing right in the face there. I mean, honestly, how many of you watch and really can't do that? It's, no, it's very simple. On this one. Because I didn't know it was like It's just in the top there over here. And that's pretty much. Do a little uh, dab. Back in the face of the buckle. Mm -hmm. So it's right around the implant. Now, I'm going to clean that off. And what I'm doing is, on this one, I'm going to place the healing cap. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take this back off. Mm -hmm. uh, I could just leave that on and put it on membrane on top of it. Or this is a technique that I'm going to do for this particular. I want a nice, wider implant healing cap so I have a good emergency profile on the tissue heals. Emergency profile so that everyone looks nice and natural for the crown. Which is a wide. Okay. Okay. See that? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to suture this tissue closed. That's it. So this is a no drill implant. Back the face with a little bit of bone. And I use the healing cap, and then I'm going to close. I have a little flexibility on the buccal and the tissue here. Okay, so I'm going to suture that, and then we're done. And if you want to take a look at the implant right here, that is the implant position. So I pack the face, and the wing will bone, put the healing cap on it. This is a good neutral you know, technique. So final, I pack the bone in the face. I did a cross suture all the way across pulling this facial and lingual tissue in to the healing cap. So now this thing is nice and solid. This is gonna heal beautifully. And now I have to uh, do a final exposure uh, while I'm there. So this is a nice technique to have a good result. It makes it easy and make it just take an impression of the Okay? Beautiful thing, it's ideal. You can do that all day long. I want to kind of go through it just for a sense, just uh, what we just saw right there. You saw just like the first implant placement, that that does not take any time at all, all right? How many of us, when we actually pull teeth, do we actually get situations like that, particularly uh, towards the back, where you can easily place an implant? I mean, this is something in the faculty office we do all day long, and this is something that all of our students get, they get experience with in doing this, all righty? You can actually do this. Alrighty, I want to talk about the next thing too. So another thing we're as we go over is we go over bone grafting. Now I know a lot of you at times, if you haven't really done it on a regular basis, this is what you think in terms of bone grafting. Maybe you borrowing something from maybe back of the jaw, flapping, pins, and all these other types of things. All right. Well, actually, in our institute, we actually teach simpler ways where you can actually do bone grafting because this is something again we do on a regular basis. And we have actually seen that when we go and when we lecture about these things. Almost every time we're in the room and we ask them questions, how many of you bone graft? We would have a room of maybe 200 doctors and you get maybe two or three that actually do that, all right? Well, this is something that we think should be standard of care. It's very easy to do and something you'll get experience with. Uh, okay, um, got another call. <laughs> oh, shoot. All right, so let's just see what is going on this time. This our Friend here. <laughs> this is really interesting stuff. You know, I'm kind of intrigued. I'm a little bit nicer right now because I'm pretty impressed. My question is, do you think you can teach a guy like myself? <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> yeah, yes, we can. All right. Uh, in, in our courses, we've actually had gentlemen that have been doing this for a while. Okay. Uh, we've actually had a couple that uh, we actually had one that was a uh, trained prosthodontist. And we actually had another gentleman who's actually world renowned, who's been doing dentistry for over 43 years. And he, he came and he wanted to have us show him a few things. And that's something that uh, we actually did. Okay. So, uh, yes, we can teach someone like this to actually uh, place an implant. So, uh, thank you so very much for the call, sir. Bone grafting. I like to keep this very, very simple here, all right? There are some of you right now who are thinking in terms of, do I use mineralized or demineralized? Well, all right, I mean, that's an argument that's been going on for about the past umpteenth years, but what I'll share with you is, you may not actually realize this, it really does not make that much of a difference, and in the Institute, come to it, and we'll actually show you why. I also take you through the basic things that we actually do of the different types of barriers, and we also go into some uh, more advanced procedures, such as stem cell bone grafting, along with certain type of patented corticancellous blocks to do some really, really advanced and fancy things. So yes, I like to think that uh, SI is actually, and always, on the cutting edge. So I want to thank you very much. Did you guys enjoy that a little bit? We have our last section here coming up on sales. There's only a little bit left, so you guys are appreciating. You guys are sitting home probably snuggled by a fireplace. Drinking a coffee? Yeah, I think so. It's your fireplace? This is Arizona, so it's like 85 degrees. Yeah, that's all right. Hey, <laughs> was nice to you. I think you won him over. Yeah. Look, look, maybe you're going to teach him some sterilization uh, techniques. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, Just okay. saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Thank you so much. And sales is coming up next. Alright, here's the last section. This is Power Sales Unleashed. New course coming by from SII. Pretty excited about the course. It's taking a little while. We are definitely, I understand you guys have been watching. We sure as heck appreciate your time. Just a little bit more, so we're gonna make this pretty quickly on the sales course. Okay? Well, let's give you a little rundown a little bit. What is a sale? Okay. A sale is you have a product that you're presenting. You're doing a discovery and you're doing a presentation, okay? So what I want you guys to understand is in sales, then you do your final presentation and then you close the deal. So you got a product being presented, value created, you're presenting money, close the deal. This is, I want you guys to imagine, not in general practice right now, I want you guys to understand some of these basic concepts. Now obviously we don't have to teach you everything tonight, but I'm gonna to try to give you a little bit of education on this, okay? Usually you deal with a rep, let's say, he's a one party salesperson. He has a product he's selling you. He is going to do what we call a discovery process. He is going to be talking to you about your challenges, your solutions, things like that. And he's going to be assessing if his product will be a solution for your needs. He's going to be doing what we call a discovery process. The discovery process is followed up by the initial financial presentation. Okay. The financial presentation is usually the littlest part of the wholesale process. So when you think with one person, that one person is opening and he's closing the deal, okay? Now those are some terms that can get some negative connotations about it, but in healthcare, we're not convincing anybody to do shit. Nada, okay? We're trying to identify the challenges that our patients are having and make them establish an emotional connection about what they want. Not what we wanna give them, what they want for themselves. Then we want that connection and emotional challenge because a sale is based on emotion, closing the deal is based on logic. Okay, so I'm gonna be kind of switching your brain around a little bit about sales in general, but I am also gonna relate it to a completely different business, and I happen to choose the car business, which everybody on the end of the line right now here, Dr. Brown, is going, oh shit, I hate the car business. Well, I, don't, I know why you hate them, and I'm gonna show you a little bit of why, but the sale process, any business that does any sales in this world know these techniques. It's a technique process. Once you understand the techniques, you can identify what's going on during the process and fix the solution. But what I was talking about is, it's easier to comprehend when one person is doing the opening and closing. The difference in the car business, it's split by two parties. In dental practice, it's split by two parties. 
You have the doctor and the whole staff and the whole presentation going through all the way to your appointment. You have your treatment plan coordinator, which in most offices try to close the deal. All they deal with is financing, which is 100% wrong. They typically don't know their products or the solutions or the discovery process that the doctors spend time on. The timing of when you do that is also important, which we can go through in our sales course. But I'm gonna to try to give you a little brief example. Behind me is, I like to video any cars that I purchase. So, here's my first shot at a car that I bought about eight, nine months ago. Let's watch it. Or not watch it. <laughs> so, we're gonna watch this video real quick. <coughs> time I'm filming it. I'm looking at the car, I'm looking at the lights, I'm looking at how clean it is, how shiny it is. I'm looking and assessing all the other things around me. Everything is polished. I'm falling in love with the car as I'm looking at it. This is actually me walking around the car that I bought. I'm like, oh my god, the tail is so cool. <laughs> all right, I was starting to want this. I was like, oh, it's a GT3, it's silver. I came in for a white one, but I settled with the silver because it really was an important factor for me. But it sure as hell was an objection. And I'll talk about that in a minute. This was my experience the first day I looked at it, okay? Now I have a buying process in my family and I don't buy anything without going through the proper buying process, which means anything over five bucks, I've done my way. <laughs> okay, well maybe not, it's, it's actually over 10. Oh, okay. But no, it's my buying process. So I already know, I went to the dealership by myself, but I already knew going in there that I'm not gonna be buying anything, signing out the dotted line. It also keeps me, because that's my, my buying process, keeps you to sign the deal and walk away with regret. Okay, so every buyer has a buying process. Okay, so that's first of all. This is a map of a dealership. Now I want you to start looking at this in relation to dentistry. I know I'm sorry I'm going so fast, but that's, get over it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on a time crunch because I know you guys are busy. When a person calls a dealership, the dealership scientifically knows what they want to steer their clients. The buyer, the entire goal in this whole process is to get a buyer on the lot. Get them on the lot. You walk on to the lot or you call in. You call in, what do they do? Immediately to the salesperson. The salesperson is 100% trained as a requirement of a dealership to be able to communicate with you effectively to bring you on where? Not an appointment, because as a dentist, but as a car business, bring you on a lot for an appointment. Get you on a lot. It's the same aspect of get them in your appointment with your doctor. See the correlation there? <clears throat> so the first point I want to make is if dealerships are getting you not to a receptionist, hi, no, hold on, hold please, getting right to a salesperson because they know that a caller is the most important thing in any business. A, buy, a person who calls in is more qualified, and we'll get back after I'm done talking about this, but take this. A call is just as important, it's supposed to go in the lot. A walk-in is supposed to go in the lot. Now, who's a better customer, a walk-in or a call? Actually, statistically, a call is, okay? So the seasoned salespeople will sit in their office, they'll accept phone calls, and then in the afternoon, they'll go out on the lot. The young guys who don't know sales training very much, they'll be on the lot hunting like vultures. That's why when you guys go to a lot, you get surrounded by a ton of people and you're, they're usually drinking coffee and smoking a shit ton of cigarettes. And you're like, oh my God, All right? <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of overwhelming. But the point I wanna make is, once you're on the lot and you get into a salesperson, somebody that's seasoned, their job is to sell you on a car. Take an initiative, sell you on a treatment plan. And it's not sell you and physically sell you on a car. It's their job is to find a car that meets your challenges, that gives you a solution. Yes, you're gonna complain. Yes, you're gonna object. We want it to be in a price point that you can afford. And we'll usually narrow you down to three and eventually narrow it down to one. And we narrow you down to one before we go back into the sales office. This office is where most of the closing happens. The closing in a dealership is this side. The opening is this side. Your experience all the way through is gonna give you a persona of what the dealership is, and when you get to the sales office, <clears throat> and they'll get you there, trust me. <laughs> this closing side, people feel a little bit spited because of the fact sometimes it can be a hard close. You have trades, credit, and you have a lot of, you have some manipulating factors that can happen in, the way they present it to you, they can present things in three different ways of the same deal, but you're gonna dissect one in a certain way. 
Now there are some applications like that in dentistry that we do go over in the sales course about the way somebody accepts the treatment plan offering, okay? But when you're here, if you go here and the young salespeople don't close, the season ones pretty much almost bring you to closing. So if you have a young salesman here, he'll need help by these guys to come in and close the deal. And usually what's happening is these guys are way more seasoned. We're walking into a room and we're finding that these objections that are happening within that room, the person may not be on the right product. The salesperson need to address those and we're gonna go over why. Okay, so let's back up. My wife bought a car. She bought a, a, a G, G, GLE. GLE. GLE 63 AMG Mercedes. It was my parting gift, well, not my parting gift. It should have been my parting gift. <laughs> That's so wrong. Yeah, I know. It was. <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah, right? She's great. She's a great mom. I love her too. She's two cool. boys. Yeah. But the back yeah. trunk has a lid on it, okay? And she was used to a bigger car. So, you know, when the salesperson got her, she knew she wanted and she got and they made her do a test drive, okay? Now you guys as a customer and buyers will think that the test drive is about selling you the product. It's really actually not. During the test drive, what a seasoned uh, salesperson is looking for is any objection to this car that you may have, okay? Now remember this as a buyer. Buyers will make up every single objection and keep on going until they sign on the dotted line. It's just part of human tendency. So during that whole car process, you asked my wife, her biggest thing was this tail lid trunk that moms have to lift the groceries up and put them in. So the salesperson on the test drive could have done two things. One, for her to voice a bitch about it. Now he's defending. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you can do this and he's indefensive. Or he can say, you know, Mrs. Chaffin, her name is Laura. Laura, you know, a lot of women actually love this car. But there's one thing that a lot of people may have an objection to. Some people think about this lid as a deterrent for the groceries, but this is the way we would look at it, blah, 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 blah. And they actually raised the question. And when he talked to my wife, I asked her, how did that make you feel? She goes, you know, it was fantastic because he understood that this may be one of the objections I had, and I didn't even have to voice it. He just raised it. We call that in sale blocking objection, okay? So when somebody's buying something, the first thing, this is proven fact, the first thing somebody's wanting is they're worried about price. As you're informing them about the treatment plan, their price objection becomes not as important. And then it goes back up before you're presenting to being the most important again. During the process of the whole sales process, this is where salespeople go and block objections. If you do not block objections about whatever they're selling that people will normally bring up, by the time the person is presenting, you're normally your treatment plan coordinator, she's not only dealing with price, she's dealing with price and a whole buttload of other crap. So that is a little glimpse of the sales process of actually, but in dentistry, it's split. We have back teams doing things, we have your treatment plan coordinators. And right now, because the sale process is split, discovery and presentation, <coughs> we've got, there's that disconnect there. And that, that disconnect, the two people opening and closing, not being in sync, is what's causing the uh, patient acceptance to be going down. It's a very easy fix. There are a lot of things in a dental practice that we, and we're gonna go through a few of them that are really important for the back office to do. But things, a couple things I want you to take from this. Phone calls, awesome importance, man. They narrow you down from three to one. Our closing techniques will be completely different in dentistry, but very the same, same techniques, but a different style, okay? Their main concern is getting you on a car that accepts that you want and the payment you can afford. The other comment that I have is, in a Honda dealership, there are 19, $20,000 Hondas, and they will focus you on a payment that is affordable. Their responsibility is to make it affordable and find financing to you to buy the car. But in dentistry, there's so many people that actually gets the closing, that A, the closers or the troop plan coordinators are not trained. They get an objection. Okay, like, let me think about it. Or the price is too high. Oh, okay. Is your coordinator trained? Do you be able to handle it with confidence and go, hmm, they're objecting. Okay. Make an objection like a complaint. Let's deal with the problem of what's going on here. Maybe they're on the wrong treatment plan. Maybe it's not staged out right. Maybe they have objections that they haven't been 
uh, blocked yet or addressed yet, okay? Maybe you're on too low of a product or too high of a treatment plan. You know, there are some things I'm going to show you to be able to guide you right through the process so the sales track is smooth. This is not scripts and things written out. These are techniques, blocking objections, how to handle stalls, kind of thing. People love stalls. Well, I got my husband, or it's just not the right time, or whatever they may be, and they'll keep doing it until you recognize what they're doing and why. So when you walk, when you listen to a buyer <coughs> and they say something, you're like, huh, that's a stall, and you know how to navigate around it. It's not manipulation. It's being able to understand the process so you can communicate it more effectively to write a treatment plan that is solving the solutions for what your client needs. And then this is just a nice, well, in the course what we do is we relate businesses. This is just one of the businesses we talk about. And we show different businesses and then we relate it to dentistry itself. There's a lot of, and you'll start noticing the very similarity. All right? So, three tips on opening, which is in the back for a dental practice. Qualify the buyer's mindset. Create the value of the product. You've heard that before. Create the value, create the value. But what the hell does that shit mean? Okay. Well, we're going to talk about that. You don't want, like right now, I'm pitching. I'm, I'm doing a lecture, of course. I'm teaching, right? When you're in a, in, in a room with your client, it needs to be a dialogue. It's like a 60 second rule. Question, answer, question, answer, like date. Okay? And there's ways to approach to open that patient up, to have them engage in that conversation, to be a part of the uh, solutions that they're choosing, not us. Okay? I don't care what they do is their mouth. Okay? And discussing budgets. Good, good, important uh, conversation now. And I know the guys at the webinar are going, wow, the freak don't do that shit. I don't want to talk about this. Okay? So, and what are common objections that we as doctors get in the room? There's plenty of them, man. We have a list. We got them all locked down. We got like about, well, 30? Well, we, well, we got, got 39 ways to close a deal because we will actually train your treatment plan coordinates. Oh, that's awesome. All right? But how do you deal with, well, the price is too high. You heard that foreign docs? The price is too high. Well, how do you deal with that? <laughs> okay, we're going to show you how. Okay? So, why qualify a mindset? What does that mean? If you have a patient that it just don't really give a rat's ass about the mouth, that's qualifying their mindset. They just don't care. And you know, instead of trying to make it work, say, hey dude, are you interested in fixing your mouth at all? Your mouth more to Nah, dude, I don't really give a shit. Great! <laughs> awesome. Well, when it becomes important to you, let me know and we can finish this exam. I'm not wasting my time. I'm not gonna shove thing on him. I don't care, it's his mouth. I'll try to maintain him out of pain, give him hygiene, but until he is, his IQ may be low. So for me, I try to raise that IQ over time with my patient so eventually he comes around. But as salespeople, the highest qualified salespeople do not concentrate all the time on non-qualified leads, okay? And we always talk about budgets. Those are important and we always create value with the product. The treatment plan coordinator, after the fact, needs to know the treatment plan and everything about it better and almost better than the doctor. Why? We're gonna tell you why in the course, okay? There's a reason for it. So if you're going back and you do this treatment plan, and then you do the presentation that same day, take a look at how they're doing it. I mean, that's handcuffing the whole sales process. So we're gonna show you how to unify that, that connection in the course. All right, doc. We call the whole process the sizzle. <laughs> so I'm a Yoda, I'm a Yoda guy. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. My, so, yeah. my, my uh, dog is named Chewbacca, <laughs> and my wife's dog is named Princess Leia. Okay, all right, now they're all out of here. So I was like, sizzle sausage. <laughs> all right. Okay, so uh, the next thing we've got, and I think it's about phone training. So switch it back down. Phone training 101, how to be a badass. Part of our course, we're really, we have a whole series where we spent half a day, it's a two-day course on phone training. <clears throat> and you saw by the previous thing of the car business how important the phone answering from the phones should be the most important part of an office. They handle everything, you go on the next slide. They handle all your appointments, they handle every call that comes into your practice. Usually the lowest paying person is your front desk. That's not good. So if there's any front desk people, I disagree with that, it should be one of the highest paying. But you've got to understand why. Now, types of communication platforms that are available. You have in-person, phone, texting, emails, social networking, and direct mail. In phones, a lot of people will answer the phones, but they won't do follow-up sales. 
in every sales game, we present a, a sale and we'll do follow-ups in two other forms. On the phone, when they're answering, answering the phone. Most of the time, hi, yeah, no, click. <laughs> $200, no, yeah, click. Or if you're lucky, hey, good morning, this is Jules. No, yes, click. Wrong, <laughs> wrong, wrong. We're, then we're gonna tell you how to engage that. Most scripts, you know, I don't care about scripts. I care about how a script is written. I also want my girls to understand the language to be able to do a script in their own way. Most scripts in the market right now, and I've done my research, are all built on what you as doctors want. I know what you want, guys. You want an appointment. But I also know what the buyer wants, okay? So, <laughs> types of calls that come in the office. You have your incoming calls, which are amazing. That's what the phone trading is about. And you also have your exiting calls where you're calling back. Now, in offices, this is a big weak point. Hence, I love National Recall. Yeah. Thank you, ladies. I love yes, you. Thank you. So, you have calls that for unclosed treatment plans. You have calls to create new customers. You have calls for old customers. National Recall, they call customer satisfaction calls for me. How was your appointment? Great, awesome, good to see you. Boom. They do all my hygiene outgoing calls. Hygiene, that is really lacked in an office because the hygienists typically hate to make phone calls. Everybody's scared of the phone. We're going to talk about why because they don't know how to handle the phone. Okay? <clears throat> so a phone is one of the most important things in a dental practice. You need to be taught how to utilize it. So would I have a team member? Would I rather... You know, hygiene, you need to make small calls every day, all the time. Two, three hours a day. And you're gonna have a consistent, but it needs to be consistent. National Recalls makes those consistent phone calls for me. Two hours a day, all week. My schedule is always packed for my hygienist. We have three of them, five to six days a week. Solid as a rock, they are trained. These people are trained to handle the phones and reactivate and book, so they do that both, okay? So, what does that leave me, guys? It leaves you for my other team members to do outgoing calls to for treatment plans, you know, creating business, following up leads. And with the, the whole virtue consult stuff, we can address that in our course as well. There's some really, really good techniques as far as this goes. So last thing I want to talk about real quick are buyer's goals. Guys call on the phone. You guys are probably saying, well, nobody on the phone is really worth a shit. Actually, statistically, in reality, a phone call those buyers know exactly what they want. They're looking for one thing. They don't care about you, they don't care if you're best practice, the plant, the nicest office, they don't give a rat to ask anything about them except themselves. They want information, that's it, information. They want to be at a distance. You here, you over there, and I'm over here. We got some distance. They don't want an obligation. They want to make a real quick phone call, no obligation. They want to save time. <coughs> I got stuff to do, and I'm gonna make a phone call, and I'm gonna find out the information I want. Most likely, do you as a practice give a lot of information? Most practices do. The girls don't even know what to give. They're trying to determine if they want what you have, they're trying to determine if they can even afford it. They're basically determining if they want your service. That's a lot of ifs, and we're gonna teach you how to handle it and why. But basically, there's a big concept. What you give is what you receive. We're gonna show you a process where what you give is what you receive, and it's easy to get the number, it's easy to get the cell phone, it's easy to get the email, and then it's easy to be able to follow up with what are you gonna give them? We're giving, we're giving, we're open, we'll help you with anything. Oh, you want the information? Great. If you're talking about this, great, we'll send you that too. Do you have any appointments in this? Great, we'll give you that too. Oh, are you sure you need a crown? Shoot. What? Maybe you don't, you don't sure? Well, you may need information on a filling. You want me to give you that too? Okay, I'll give alternatives. Oh, by the way, uh, what was your first name? Oh, great, what's your cell, what's your email? So I can organize that, pull please real quick. Get by online. Hey, I'm gonna be sending that off to you right now. Got a question, do you have a pen? Yeah, my name is uh, J-A-M-E-S. I give my cell phone and I spell it out, they're gonna write that down. It's called selling your name, blocking that appointment. So we're gonna teach you a lot of those concepts to make your phone girls badasses. And that's called like, getting educated, getting trained, rehearsing, but getting the entire team on board. And then we're gonna get your treatment plan coordinator connected with your doctor, and we're gonna work on that flow. Guys, thank you for listening to my 100 yard dash. Was that quick? That was quick, but that was 
Good, because you, you definitely know sales. Well, I was going through that like it's out of wild freeze a lot, freestyling, but I wanted to make sure that I covered some topic there so you guys can understand some of those concepts on how not to convince your patients. It's how to, to communicate effectively so they feel loved and actually buy your service. That's right, I definitely want to thank everyone that uh, came <coughs> on in to see us. And I definitely want to thank Dr. Franks. Dr. Franks, absolutely. <laughs> and once again, I'm gonna thank you guys as well. And I also want to thank National Recall for putting on a splendid uh, webinar. That's right. We appreciate you guys. Uh, actually, when you guys get a chance, take a look. We All of our SI products uh, practices actually utilize their service. They're uh, amazingly saving me a ton of energy, some of the time, and my girls absolutely love them. So check them out. Thank you again, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.